Thank you, everybody, for being here. Appreciate you uh, sticking it out for the full two days. I know it's a long couple of days, but I promise this will not disappoint. Um, I am, by a wide margin, the least uh, least qualified person to be discussing this up here. We have, I mean, a number of uh, industry experts. I want to welcome everybody. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to give you all a chance to uh, to introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about yourselves, and, uh, and then we could dive right in. So Joshua, why don't you go ahead? Excellent. Um, so I'm a computer scientist. I work heavily on the tech of blockchain crypto. Um, I have had some experience in regulation of the tech as well, so I'm now open towards speaking with um, legal professionals, like uh, one of our other academics here. Um, and I would say, yeah, that, that, that wraps me up for now. Hi, I'm Dr. Rachel O'Connell, and I'm CEO and founder of Trust Elevate, and we do EKYC for under-18s, and I'm also the technical author of a standard that describes how you do that in a privacy, zero-knowledge way, so I'm excited to be here. Thank you. My name is Ioannis. I'm a legal academic at the University of Malta, and I've spent the past 10 years torturing myself with the regulation of emerging technologies. Not an easy task for people like me that come from the analog world, but in the meantime, I hope I can follow up and very much look forward to joining the discussion. So, Brett Johnson, I work for Enchain. We're a software development company specializing on uh, blockchain technology. Uh, we uh, developed and maintained the node software for BSV, uh, a blockchain which is very highly scalable uh, and low transaction costs. Hi guys, I'm uh, Jean-Michel. I've been in the blockchain space full time since 2017 and uh, now I find myself advising a couple of Web3 startups um, and hopefully sort of nudge them in the right direction. That's a little summary. Perfect, and I'm Corey Padvin, your moderator, and certainly not a PhD in, uh, in the space, uh, more of a consultant. So obviously the first question I wanna go for, because I'm sure there aren't as many PhDs out here as there are on the, on the table here. So Joshua, why don't we start with you? I wanna start by just dispelling this idea that there's an inextricable linkage between blockchain and crypto. I think that that's an area that has sort of plagued the growth of the space. So if you could talk a bit more about the underlying tech and where its value can be, uh, I think that would be helpful. Indeed. So um, let's start by saying, actually, there is an intimate connection, but yet there also isn't an intimate, intimate connection. There are blockchains out there that are heavily dependent upon the cryptocurrency that are powering the blockchain. That's how certain blockchains achieve the ability to reach consensus, because there's an incentive. So that's one type of blockchain. Then there's other types of blockchains where we don't need crypto to operate these networks. And really and truly, I think we should probably stop talking about blockchain as a term because people, they, they don't really care about um, the technology itself, right? Like if we talk about email, we don't care that there's SMTP, TCP, IP, blow it. What blockchain can give us, and this is what we should focus on, is transparency, auditability, verifiability, making sure that processes in place can't be tampered with. Now, these sorts of features in a system are desirable, irrespective of the type of technology, if we could have a system that can't be cheated, wouldn't we want to use a system like that? So, cryptocurrencies aside, um, let's say a lot of the ethos behind the space aside, where people just want this technology to decentralize everything, get rid of centralized powers, let's remove that mentality. If we could create a system where the operators, the regulators, the players have full guarantees that the system will do exactly what it's written to do, nothing more, nothing less, no people, no stakeholders can be cheated, isn't that desirable? So that is what the technology can bring to the space. Well, and I think that that sort of, and that brings Rachel into, into the mix specifically about the consumer protection side. I mean, we talked a bit about KYC in the, the intro here, but if you could talk a bit more about the eKYC and how, how the blockchain factors in there for, for player protections. Absolutely. So um, for Trust Elevate, we're the first company in the world to solve the problem of verifying an, a, a relationship between a parent and a child, which you have to do under the General Data Protection Regulation, Article 8, requires, you, requires all companies to abstain, obtain consent before processing kids' data. Um, and then the unsolvable problem was how do you know the age of, of kids? And from a standards perspective, from an ISO standards perspective, this is a multi, multi, it's a complex and multi-dimensional type problem. And when you're looking at KYC and levels of assurance, how sure can you be? How much confidence can a, a, a gaming company have in the verification process? And it, a lot of you will have noticed, um, certainly in the in the gaming, in the iGaming, the use of OCR technologies to scan. Hmm. Uh, um, 
passports and driver's license, and then you do a present aliveness test. So you will also be aware of the, the, the hacks around that, that you can bypass the, the, the camera and stuff. So we're at a kind of stage where looking at the, the marriage between blockchain and uh, identity and KYC verification is a little bit trem tremulous right now because, because of AI, the use of AI in, in conducting KYC, because people have figured out K workarounds for that, um, that's creating some challenges. So, in terms of the matrix and understanding the levels of assurance that you can be that can be associated with that, that's that's a bit of a, a, a head scratcher. But there are a lot of people working on that and thinking about how we can use self-sovereign identity and decentralized ledgers to enable the user to have more control over their the, how their identity is used. But it's certainly a, a, a very hot topic at the moment. But I saw John Michelle, you were just you were just agreeing there with with some of what Rachel was talking about, and I know that uh, prior to prior to our discussion here, we were discussing um, protections uh, from hacks. We were talking in the esports side, but obviously that applies too on the iGaming side. So, and I know you're a, a blockchain purist, so uh, if you could dive uh, a little bit more into into how those protections factor in, both on the player side, but also on the on the actual operator, and in an iGaming space, the uh, the provider side might be. Okay, so um, I mean to. Rachel's point, um, we, I ran a pen test once for um, a KYC customer and uh, one of the ways that we um, broke their systems basically was by using, using a photoshopped image of an ID and replacing the name with SQL injection code. So as soon as you sort of scan that in, you're just automatically into the, into the, into the system. So, um, they, they, there's, there's a few benefits, I think, for, for both sides. Um, I don't think the, the, the um, okay, so let's roll this back. If you're, if you're a user, the benefits are that uh, if you use some kind of blockchain, then hopefully if it's implemented well, you would be able to avoid um, identity theft. Um, for example, right? So when you think about blockchain and the value that it creates, it can only really create it in two ways, right? And that's reducing fraud and automating admin. That's it. That's literally it. Blockchains don't do anything else. They are, they are fucking terrible compared to, um, uh, compared to um, a centralized tech for the vast majority of things. But in cases where fraud is... is is a huge issue, and admin is a huge issue, then there's a lot of value to be had, right? There's a sort of smart contract aspect, and then there's the, and then there's the, there's the um, digital identity aspect. But on the player side, or on the sort of operator side, uh, if there's an issue with bonus abuse, for example, right? So uh, I don't know, someone gives me 50 free spins over $50, I create 100 different accounts and just, just game them until one of them sure. pays me out, right? Um, the, the flip side of that is the cost of the operator needs to implement KYC, which might be commercially unviable, because when you make things, for example, um, Rachel, you mentioned the um, uh, um, passport and OCR stuff, right? You can do KYC with a passport by scanning the NFC chip, right? You just grab your phone and you yeah. grab the passport and slap that to the um, phone and you get um, information from a government-signed chip. But most companies that don't do it because of the markets which they operate in. And that's, yeah. that's a sort of business decision by design, yeah. right? So I think the technical benefits um, are outweighed by, the, by commercial interests for the most part. Well, and I think, you know, you, you talk about the operator, you talk about cost, you talk about adoption. Uh, obviously, any sort of digital transformation is a, a huge undertaking mm -hmm. for any company. Uh, the costs involved oftentimes are why companies don't adopt a new technology. Mm -hmm. I know, um, Brett, we were talking before about uh, some of what Enchain is doing, uh, discussing the cost side. So if you could talk a bit about some of the improvements over the last, even the last few months, the last couple of years, in operating on the blockchain from the cost perspective uh, that operators may not necessarily be aware of. One of the um, largest costs of implementing a blockchain um, is the cost per transaction and also the latency or the uh, volume of transactions per second. Uh, Enchain have um, uh, enabled larger block sizes, so uh, we can actually process 50,000 transactions per second at the moment and we will increase that this year. So we've got the, the, the capacity to put high volumes of transactions through and that also reduces the cost and the power consumption. 
So whereas you're paying, you can pay up to the dollars per transaction on some of the blockchains, cost a fraction of a cent on our blockchain, um, and also uh, the power utilization, which is becoming more and more important, is very very low. So I think you know there's there really doesn't seem much much denying that there's a lot of benefits both to the consumer um, and to to the operators too. Jonas, I'd like to ask you because your background is on the the legal front. Um, what specifically, from maybe possibly from a regulatory standpoint, possibly on the legal front, what do you see as possibly being uh, major hurdles that are preventing this sort of mass adoption across the iGaming space? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably time for the low guy to ruin the party, huh? <laughs> <laughs> By not That's right, well, you answer this and then we'll all just get mad at you. <laughs> um, no, I understand why this question is usually framed in these terms, because indeed the law is usually being treated as some kind of a hurdle. But after spending quite some time with computer scientists and some time in the blockchain space, I came to realize that in reality, the two are complementing one another. They are not necessarily opposites. They are not necessarily competing for something. They are just different means of expressing the need to put a framework on whatever activities we're trying to build, right? For example, here we are reflecting on the possibility of applying blockchain technologies on the gaming industry. Now, the gaming industry comes with a certain risk profile, right? We mentioned consumer protection. Uh, there are problems that have to do with money laundering. There are problems that have to do with tax evasion and the such. We can, of course, disagree on the level of regulation that is necessary, but I don't think we would disagree that some rule book is necessary. Now, whether these rules will come from a system like blockchain or whether they will come from a government, I think it should not make such a huge difference in the sense that the cooperation of the two can, at the end of the day, be much more productive. To give an example, Consumer protection, very important goal. The entire EU law is built around consumer protection, which means that blockchain and the law are not really clashing on that one. Mm. If blockchain can help us make consumer protection more efficient, it's very much welcome to do so. In fact, even better, because it lifts some of the burden that we have in our shoulders, and we have quite a lot. Um, what I'm trying to say is that my, my understanding is that the law needs to be seen as something that could encourage the adoption of blockchain. To give another example, I'm sure that everybody in the room must at least have heard about these markets and crypto assets regulation. Is it better in a way that in Europe we at least have some kind of regime? We at least know how we treat crypto assets. Look, I know the crypto space is constantly in flux and not all the definitions in the law are going to be perfect. But at least we have, let's say, a rule book to orient our investments and our risks towards. Uh, towards. On the other hand, if we look at the United States where no such rule book exists, there is only friction and, let's say, uh, infighting. So I would say that, generally speaking, the two can work nicely together. So would you say, uh, and this, this is a question I, I'd like to pose to everybody because I'm sure there'll be maybe some different opinions about it, but would you say that it's more a question of regulation, and this, this would be unique um, from, what I've, from people I've spoken to, but would you say it's more a question of regulation coming first and then adoption to follow, or would you say that it's more a question of um, once operators start, that'll, make a, that'll provide a clear framework for regulators to get more involved? So we'll start with you and then we'll work our way yes. down. Yes, I mean, my, my, my idea is that uh, innovation and uh, commercial developments will occur no matter what the law says. This is always the case. There is nothing that the law can do in order to dictate where the market is going to innovate. Mm. This is why the law, in a way, has adapted. And, and, and what we do is that we let a market develop for a period of time. And during this time, we monitor the risk profile. If we identify any patterns that we know from the past, we will interfere, but we will interfere in a way that will help the market to grow, but not to stifle. Of course, I understand that in this process, not everybody is going to be happy, right? Sure. Like, like everybody who is, for example, issuing a so-called shitcoin, sorry for the bad language, is going to be angry now that the micro-regulation is coming. But let them be. Right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Brett. 
Your thoughts on yeah, well, technology always question. moves a lot faster than legislation. So I think it will be a question of uh, legislation catching up with technology. Uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, we, we do want, as Ionis mentioned, the shit coins. Uh, we don't want them right. uh, in the industry. We don't want the bad press that um, uh, of certain exchanges collapsing. Um, really want this uh, to be a mature industry where people feel safe and secure utilizing that technology. Michelle? Um, regulation, I think, is a, is a sort of harbinger for change, right? And it's, it's, um, it's very much a, um, a double-edged sword. So um, we've practically, I would say, almost ruined the internet in its current form with the amount of regulation which we've created. We've created a bunch of rules which are impossible to follow, almost impossible to enforce. And, uh, and the world, or the, the um, um, commercial world rather, thrives on sort of eluding regulators for as long as it can. And it knows that once a fine comes, that's the cost of doing business. Um, on the other hand, having regulation um, can enable certain businesses, right, to, 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 to operate in, in the ways they should, like MICA, for example, which will sort of cull, cull away more shit coins. But um, I think that, the, that the, the, the best innovations, I think, will, will, will come as a result of a business driver. So if there is, there will be a way, like, the project, for example, which which uh, I'm working on, um, if you're able to create KYC for children, then you arguably solve all the friction points that kids have in transacting with any kinds of games. By games, I mean like Fortnite and that sort of stuff, right? So that's that's value. You don't need need Emma regulation for that. It's nice to have it, but. When you sell something like that, the driver is you're going to make more money as a result. And that's where the real innovation is. It shouldn't just be, and it's a kind of a sad world that we live in, but we do live in like a reality where nobody's going to invest in something unless they have to or it makes them money. Sure. Makes sense. Not sure. Um, so <laughs> let's take the perspective of that. Um, do we need regulation at the end of the day? And um, if we think about what regulation is, we often think there's a regulator, there's governments, there's, there's leg legislators that are controlling us. Really, regulation is much wider. All we're talking about is putting in place rules to make sure that people don't get cheated. Now, do we need the former type with governments and legislators? Um, well, let's say that we could automate a lot of regulation in smart contracts and in code and do away with the government oversight. Um, that's great, and it's great whilst the code works correctly. Mm. And code works correctly a lot of the time. But if we have learned anything over the decades of software development that we've been doing, code bugs will always crop up. Now, no matter what levels of assurance you're implementing, whether it's testing, static verification, runtime verification, we can never, and any computer scientist worth their salt or who knows the space, will agree that we can never guarantee that code is 100% correct. Mm. There is always a specification gap between what we want to achieve and what we've actually implemented. So even if we can implement a lot of these checks in code, there always might be a bug. How do we get around that? This is where the regulatory framework, where the powers that be, the governments, that's where they need to step in. And this is really um, because people are bad. We are bad. If we, did not, if we were not bad, we would not need regulation. So I have the view, much like Yanis, where um, we need regulation. We don't need to stifle innovation. We should automate as much of the burdens as possible. But where necessary, we need this wrapper to protect things when they go wrong. And the reality is, innovation goes forward. And innovation is going to continue to go forward. And regulation will catch up. But the innovation we're seeing in this space doesn't allow for mass adoption. I mean, come on. Who uh, of our parents or out of your groups of friends can actually use a wallet, can actually um, keep track of their 12 uh, passphrases? If they lose it, they lose all of their crypto. Right? We're not there yet from a technology perspective. Um, we're not there yet from a trust perspective. FTX is a perfect example why we need regulation. Mm. So regulation will catch up. The, the fear is that then there's over-regulation, where they start burdening sure. and stifling innovation. But I see it as a, a beautiful marriage if done properly. Rachel. Yeah, so, so speaking to your point, like trust elevators where the rubber hits the road in terms of we enable compliance, 
And the innovation then enables businesses to build trust, to get permission from uh, children and, and their parents for processing data. That can uh, equate to a 10 to 30 percent increase in revenue. It enables re you to protect your market. And once um, we're working very closely with Deloitte, for example, and they're developing trust metrics. How do you build trust and what is the impact? How do you measure the impact on your bottom line? And it's 4x um, an increase in the value of the company in terms of if it's a trustworthy company. 88% of people will buy from a brand again if they trust them, right? And certainly what we've been through over the last as a social media, the, the kind of lack of trust there is in terms of how they handle our data and the respect that they have for us. So trust as a differentiator is a hugely important thing that directly impacts the bottom line. So the regulation in that case is, is enacting mm, uh, sure. the support for that innovation. And the, I work in a, in a space where it's a new marketplace that's been created through standards and regulation that's been converted into helping businesses to understand especially in web 3.0 mm. companies are like hey we know what has happened in the previous web we want to make it a, a better one and we want to value from that and then just at the basic uh, mathematics a one percent reduction churn for a company for a telco for example equates with a lot of money so we, I spend a lot of my time talking about those sorts of benefits to the business and helping people to understand that compliance is not necessarily an overly burdensome and costly thing. It's actually something you can leverage to your advantage. Well, I'd be curious. I'd be curious to further get your thoughts then, um, because it sounds. It certainly sounds that like the benefits exist, and that there's there is a world where we do have a, a fine balance between the operator, the regulator, the, the use of blockchain across the board. Um, I'd be curious to get your thought. And you know, obviously, there's an opportunity where it can be used across the board. You know, build out a completely uh, decentralized operation. But clearly, there are going to be some smaller steps involved to to get to that point. So, Rachel, we'll start with you. Um, where would you see the the first opportunity? Obviously. I think I think I can guess your answer from a KYC standpoint. <laughs> um, but but if you could yeah. just talk a bit more about specifically why KYC maybe if that's if that's your answer, yeah, who knows? Yeah. But if, why that might be a good starting point for for the use of blockchain. It's a fantastic starting point because, and it's also um, for, um, for example, the reason <laughs> Trust Elevate why we've been successful is we've. Uh, built a business case for governments and non-governments to get us access to authoritative data sources. And we've started to look at, thing, look at KYC and AML requirements and say, why is it that you have to, to open a bank account, you need to come to the bank with two utility bills? Right, so a poor person who's paying for ch a gas and electricity with their coins doesn't have a bank account, so right. that excludes the kids from ever having a bank account. But if we think intelligently mm. about the data that is available, that is around the place, that is currently not queryable through APIs, what if we were to kind of liberate that and have an open data approach to that so that you can support the growth of decentralized uh, KYC on the, on the uh, right? So that's part of what we've been doing is like looking at building those business cases and getting the buy-in from those uh, data providers so that we can enable new sources of business um, and for um, things like delegated responsibility for the gamut. So those kids that, are, that we're verifying right now, they ha will have a, a, a digital wallet and they'll have tenure. So when they come to, um, uh, to, to get 18 plus uh, verification, they will have a history of um, their uh, credentials having been used for over 10 years, for example. So they build up social proof. So there are, very, there are different ways. KYC, as we know it, is evolving. Sure. Um, and that is having an impact then in terms of how regulators are think and lawmakers are thinking about the parameters and the principles that underpin the laws and the operate how you operationalize that, right? So that is a huge, a massive opportunity um, in terms of... Uh, the way forward and the EIDAS architecture that supports mobile bank and EID um, is looking at digital wallets and looking at ways in which it can support the growth of uh, companies that will support that. Jonas, would you agree that KYC is a good opening point for blockchain to get in, in more involved in the AI gaming space or do you see it some, somewhere else? Yes, KYC is an important point and I have nothing to add uh, in that regard. I think it has been covered expertly. Uh, what I would see a potential from my side is the promise of blockchain to give users control over their identity and data. Mm -hmm. I think for me that is in fact the most important bet not only for the gaming industry but for all digital industries uh, in general. If blockchain could somehow 
allow us to grasp control over what we own, over our personal information, and over our digital existence, I believe that this is a noble cause and it's worth being supported. Also from the side of the regulator since I come from, uh, from that world. And I don't think we have to go far. Unfortunately, or hope or, or for the better, I'm old enough to remember the internet before Facebook and before all that. It's a great time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Let's say graphically challenging, <laughs> but, at least, but at least users were more in control. Not like, neon. like people could legitimately say, I own a website. Can we today say we own a website? Can we today say we own our account? Like I myself, for example, I have over, I don't know, six or 700 books on Google Books. And every day I live with the fear that they might shut down the server one day and my investment will go away with them. And, you know, I use the example of books. The same example can be used for the industry that we are discussing. Let's say that I have all my betting history and all my assets and everything on a centralized server. They close down, they walk away. Ooh, excellent. What do I, where do I go from there? So well, if, if, if blockchain can get us there, yes, absolutely. And, that, and I mean, that's exactly what you saw in the early days of iGaming. You saw a lot of bad actors who were doing exactly that. And so that, I think that's, that's a great point. Brett. Uh, we, uh, just back to the KYC, um, we have seen a lot of interest from, uh, from a different angle in terms of the data um, behind KYC checks uh, is auditable reg by yeah. regulators. Yeah. And uh, we've seen companies like M uh, one of Moody's companies are working with us in terms of keeping an auditable track of data, mm -hmm. when the checks were taken place, uh, what information was checked, when that happened. Mm. Um, so there's a piece of... Um, te there's technology helping existing regulations, making sure people are compliant. Yeah, good use case, yeah. John michel where do you see it as a first entry point? Um, I'm going to forget the first entry point and maybe talk about the grand vision. I think grand that's, vision. The, that's, the, that's a little bit more fun. <laughs> um, although I think um, the KYC is probably it, right, as far as sort of, um, a first, first entry point goes. Um, I think that as much as I agree with Ioannis, at a, at a personal level, um, I think the market doesn't care about ownership. I think ownership isn't, uh, isn't a USP. Um, to me, it's, it's extremely important, but I know that I'm the, I'm the vast minority, right? Your average person cares about what they can get out of it, right? So, um, trust, I think, is, is, is one of the biggest issues in the gambling space, right? I mean, if it's two sort of industries which really suffer from trust, it's gambling and adult, right? Those, they're, they're kind of up there. So I think, um, I think there will be a syndicate of, um, of small operators that will, that will come together and create, create a wallet. Um, in which a user would be able to log in to an operator website without ever entering any personal data. And they would be able to pay and transact without ever, ever giving the merchant their, uh, their um, card data. And once a couple of operators have realized how much less customer friction there is, to your point, Rachel, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. How much less customer friction there is with when trust is pre-baked, Mm -hmm. then I think it will create a massive wave. And I think Amazon is one of the best examples ever, right? You can go to website A, you can see a product, and you can see it for $20, and you can go to Amazon, and if it's $28, you're going to go to Amazon, and you're going to buy it on Amazon, because you're not going to register with this new site just to save eight bucks and trust them with your fucking card details. It's not going to happen, right? So that's where I think the... Industry is going, and, and I think, you know, and to that point, I think you know one of the things that you're starting to see is that there's an erosion of trust um, with with virtually any brand that isn't a globally recognized one. The same goes for iGaming. And there's a reason why the, the biggest players keep getting bigger, and so the opportunity for smaller operators to start to start rising up might be through through the use of, of trustworthy technologies. So. Exactly. I mean, like people can't even trust people they meet on. Facebook and LinkedIn the other day because 30% of them are bots and hackers and Indians living halfway around the world like um, running scams, yeah. right? Like, wouldn't this be an amazing benefit for the gaming industry if they could just have the baked in trust? Right. Mm -hmm. 
Joshua. Yeah, I would just amplify on that argument that um, if we look at um, regulatory frameworks and when regulatory frameworks do stifle operations, those types of frameworks are great for big operators. They have the cash that they can pump at all of the compliance and regulation, but it's terrible for the small operators. And using blockchain, using smart contracts, we can automate processes. Mm, yeah. If we can automate processes and reduce some of the burdensome compliance, mm. that means the regulators don't have to worry. The code will do exactly what it's trying to do, seems to be correct, so we can remove some of the extra um, requirements on the operators. This means that we could democratize um, service provision for the smaller operators, and I think that is um, a potential great that blockchain can bring. But what we need to see is that people trust the blockchain. Ultimately, it's based on consumers. If consumers are going to trust the big brands, the big players, um, that is going to be the reality we live in. Um, Just to interject here for a second. Please. The, the the underlying tech, as much as I love blockchain, I'm a firm believer that the underlying tech doesn't matter to 99% of all people, Indeed. right? It's all about what value you can create mm. with the tech. So look at the gambling industry. Bonus abuse is probably one of the biggest, one of the biggest issues they have, right? Like, I'm the, the, I'm as I was mentioning earlier. And because there's so much bonus abuse, that cost is spread by the operator over all the users, right? Because they have to make money at the end of the day. So if someone's scamming them, then that's a cost, right? Which you as a player have to pay for, right? But if I can set you up as a player in a way where your identity is verified and I can trust for sure that, that all your transactions are legitimate, I can give you benefits and bonuses I can't give to someone off the street. Well, no, and I think you know, and I think that, that sort of brings. And we have a couple of minutes here, so I do want to just get um, what, get your opinions on one last thing, which I think, and to those points, to Joshua's point, Jean Michel's point, I think one area that is is worth noting is where our current biggest hurdle is. Uh, what is it that's currently preventing even even the the exploration or the foray into the space, uh, and and what what first step needs to be taken to sort of overcome that and start to get blockchain integrated across the board or even some small spaces. So Joshua, we'll start with you. We'll continue. Yeah. On. It's, it's a niche area. Um, it's a bunch of crypto bros and crypto hobbyists who are in, in the space. And it doesn't make sense for many companies to jump on that if it's such a niche area. Um, we need the technology to advance, and it will in time. We'll get there with our um, technology tools because the UI is still terrible. Education, awareness. So we need a lot of effort in that direction. And ultimately, over time, people will decide whether this is the type of system they want to use. I don't know whether we will. We'll see. Rachel. I've been working in the kind of privacy enhanced technology space for about 12 or 15 years now. And I think that one of the key um, things is going to be we have an idea that the, the way the internet is working and the, and the commercial model that underpins it right now is that our, we're tracked everywhere and our data is compiled. So the psychographic profiles are created so that we can be targeted sufficiently. The attention economy is, means that your, the behavior modification techniques and the psychographic profiling, so you keep scrolling and doing whatever. So we have a mindset that that's the way it has to be. Um, but there are people that are working in terms of flipping that CRM system to vendor relationship management kind of thing. So you own your data and you say, hey, I'm, I want to go on a holiday, um, and you will you will advertise yourself in terms of saying I want I'm a holiday in, in a sunny place. This is my budget. This many people will be coming. So then the 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 the, the provider of that targets you with the in response to that. So changing the mindset to put the person at the the consumer at the center of those transactions and having that degree of control. I think that's the kind of killer. Um, kind of application that will make people say, actually, I, that's what I want. It's easy, and that has to be simple and easy to use. So there are company, a couple of companies out there like uh, Miko.me and others that are trying to build that business model um, uh, to support that, to help us as consumers to understand that it doesn't have to be the way it is right now. There are alternatives, and they're simple and easy to use, and these are trusted companies. So I think that's how, that's how, the applic how we can build that um, sea change. Yoresh. Yes. Uh, on my end, I will partially share the pessimism expressed by Jean Michel about whether end users are willing to adopt blockchain. But I will give it an optimistic twist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do I mean by that? Programmers, 
technologies and emerging technologies are educating us, are causing paradigm shifts. If we think about it 20 years ago, we didn't care about social media, we didn't care about existing online. They taught us to be like that. By the same token, blockchain can teach us that a different internet is mm -hmm. possible, that a different gaming industry is possible. But it will take sincere effort from the side of blockchain aficionados to achieve that, because right now, if we want to be honest, all they do is expressing the greed through shady coins. They haven't come up with an application that is convincing that, yeah, we're, we're getting there. So I believe that these two sides should slowly converge, that consumers should accept more responsibility, and the blockchain space must also accept more responsibility in developing more useful applications. Brett? Um, so I, I believe the technology is there today. So we, we can get the throughput that we need. We can get the economy of scale that we need. Um, it's a, a change in attitudes. Um, you know, nobody wants to be first. So uh, the, I think we won't see the mass adoption until we get some of these uh, early startup organizations changing uh, people's culture and acceptance of using blockchain. And a final word for Jean-Michel. Uh, I think the golden moment will happen when we, stop, when we stop talking about blockchain and start talking about value. Well, panelists, thank you guys all so much. Very educational, very informative. We did explore a little bit of uh, human nature and philosophy, so I'm sure that was a treat for everybody too. Um, thank you all, and uh, we'll move on to our next one. Thank you.